Okay, we have um, Ernie, and he was with, oh, so many things. If you read his um, biography that, or his introduction, he earned his PhD at Santa Barbara in cross-cultural religious studies under um, the person he's going to share with us today. And he sent some information and reading that, it's just like, wow, I just can't wait to hear from him. He was um, at Still Point and um, he's a member of the board. And I noticed in his um, introduction that he sent to us, he's facilitated more than 100 spiritual exploration groups and retreats. And it's like, wow, that's just really awesome. So we're so excited to have Ernie with us today. So Ernie, I'll give it over to you. Thank you. Um, having had opportunity to lead that many retreats and workshops is a side effect of having got as old as I am now. <laughs> um, I too tend to wake up at about three in the morning. I have a regularly scheduled appointment at three in the morning where I fail to solve all the world's problems. It takes me quite a while to go back to sleep. Um, I'm going to switch over to PowerPoint for screen sharing and either Carolyn, I can't see Carolyn on my other screen right now, I can see Joe. If my voice starts going away or if something seems to be going wrong, um, Joe, if you would gesticulate um, Yes, like that. That will catch my attention. Uh, otherwise, I won't be able to see my main screen because it's going to be PowerPoint. Starting almost now. You should see a, a blank black screen. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, that's probably not very interesting. So we'll get more interesting. In the title, I put the in in quotes because I would almost almost say, as Ramon probably would as well, God is relationality. So we can say God is in relationality. I would say God is relationality. This is Ramon Panikar. <laughs> he was born in Barcelona in 1918. He became a Roman Catholic priest and he held doctorates in philosophy, in chemistry, and in theology. He spoke multiple languages and he wrote in most of them. Um, he tends to be better known, I have no idea why, better known in other parts of the world than he is in the U.S. Um, he, he died in 2010 and He's especially well known, I think, in Italy and in Spain, where he came from. And, and anyway, almost anywhere outside the U.S., he's much better known than he is here. He wrote a lot. These are just a few of his titles. Here are some more. The book, The Rhythm of Being, was compiled from the Gifford lectures that he delivered in 1989. Uh, they were finally published just a few months before he died in 2010. The Rhythm of Being was his last published book, but it was not the last book that he wrote. His last book was The Experience of God. Um, the Experience of God is a relatively short book compared to some of his tomes. <laughs> Um, I think in the experience of God, he was trying to make himself a bit more accessible than he was in some of his more philosophical and theological writings. But still, this, this little book is not necessarily a very easy read anyway. Panikkar was deeply familiar with a number of different religious traditions, and he tends to make reference to uh, passages from all of those. And that results in there being a lot of passages in his books where people would not 
necessarily know what he's talking about unless they were familiar with the tradition that the quote comes from. One aspect of Panikkar that doesn't necessarily come across in his books, especially his philosophical books, which can be kind of thick, if you read that little essay, Nine Ways Not to Talk About God, that I sent around, um, you can see what I mean by his, his work sometimes being pretty thick to read. One aspect of him that doesn't really come across in that kind of writing is his joy. Pierre Thierry de Chardin once wrote that joy is the surest sign of the presence of God. And I think Ramon Panikkar in person was an embodiment of joy. I remember one time Ramon was invited here in Santa Barbara quite a while ago to deliver a paper in a conference that was called the conference was called The Psychology of Religion, and so he titled his paper The Religion of Psychology. It was fairly typical of, him, of the way he loved to play with language. In his live public talks, Ramon would usually offer an exquisitely reasoned philosophical and theological discourse interspersed with parables, prayer, sometimes poetry. That's an approach I'm trying to emulate here, especially after Carolyn admonished me not to geek out too much. <laughs> not to geek out by diving too deeply into the philosophical and theological details of Panikkar. I could talk for hours about his philosophy and theology, and, and so I won't. Um, I was in his graduate seminar for five years. He called the seminar Cross-Cultural Religious Anthropology. And that's almost 30 years ago now, and I'm still in the process of absorbing and integrating what I learned from him. This is one of his most famous quotes. I left Europe when he went to India. I left Europe as a Christian. I discovered I was a Hindu and returned as a Buddhist without ever having ceased to be a Christian. Panikkar was born to an Indian, a Hindu Indian father and a Spanish Roman, Roman Catholic mother. So he was literally born to dedicate his life to dialogue across boundaries. He was a personification of non-dual consciousness. Uh, somebody, I think it was Ewart Cousins, once said that Panikkar was a, he was a person in whom the mutation has already happened. Personally, I was brought up Catholic. I became quite disillusioned with Christianity during the Vietnam era, when my only exposure to Christianity when I lived in Los Angeles was uh, kind of cheerleaders for the Vietnam War. So I decided I'm not one of those and I identified myself as explicitly non-Christian for several years. Here's another of my favorite quotes from him. We are, all of us, the legitimate heirs of the sum total of human wisdom. So it was Ramon Panikkar who enabled me to find my way back to Christianity without, as he would say, ever ceasing to be Buddhist. For about 35 years, I've been an elder in a Presbyterian congregation, the last thing I ever expected to find myself, and I still call myself a Buddhist Christian. Almost as long as I remember, can remember, I've also been what I call a planet empath. The wonder of the earth, the plight of the earth, are part of my spiritual and even my physical life. And that's another reason that I resonated so deeply with Ramon Panikkar. There's another quote of his. Religion is not an experiment. It is an experience of life through which one is part of the cosmic adventure. In his seminars, Ramon never asked us to write term papers he encouraged us instead to express our experience of the seminar by composing sutras, 
short statements full of reflected meaning. In a lot of ways, writing a set of short sutras is harder than writing a long term paper. Sutras comes from uh, Indian scriptures. They're, they're called the short sayings in Indian scriptures are called sutras, and it's the word from which we get our word sutra. Uh, sutra literally means uh, thread. So he had us write sutras instead of term papers. Here's one of mine. You are always complete and you're never finished. A traditional way of saying this same thing is that God loves you just the way you are and God wants you to continue to grow. But what are the limits to our growing? What are the boxes, the closed containers that hold us firmly in place and keep us from growing? The narrowest container and the tightest box with the strongest walls is the ego. All spiritual traditions say this, the separate self, the self-enclosed, self-absorbed ego self is what needs to be transcended in order to allow for growth and deeper realization, to allow for an experience of God. All spiritual traditions say this. What's more, a world made up of self-enclosed egos is a terribly lonely world. There's no experience of God here. There may be a, a wealth of opinions about God. There might be a multitude of incompatible beliefs about God. And certainly there are millions of separate experiences of things. But, quoting Ramon again, the experience of God is not an experience of anything, nor an experience of anyone the experience of God is not a special experience nor a specialized one. It is pure experience. It's precisely the contingency of being with, living with. Because I am not, I cannot be an isolated being. All spiritual traditions say this. All spiritual traditions remind us that the, the isolated ego self that thinks it stands outside the universe as a spectator instead of a participant, this is the biggest thing we have to transcend to allow for growth. Ramon coined a lot of words in trying to express the non-dual consciousness that he experienced and to express God as relationality. One of those words is uh, cosmotheandric. This is the title of one of his books. The word was intended to express his Trinitarian vision of reality. He has another book called The, Tri the Trinity and the Human Religious Experience. He considered the Trinitarian experience to be a human universal across cultures, uh, regardless of what words might be used to describe it. So his, his word is cosmotheandric. Cosmos referring to the physical living universe. Theos referring to the divine reality, which some call God. Andros is specifically human. Here with apologies, Carolyn, I'm going to put in a brief <laughs> geekiness moment. Panikar's Trinitarian vision, the cosmos, the theos, and the andros, uh, he said the relationship between those dimensions of reality are the same as the relationship between the three persons of what we call the Trinity. Um, the three persons, as Christian tradition describes them, the three persons are distinct, but not separate. You cannot separate them. They can distinguish but not separate. And the traditional Christian word for that, technical Christian word, is perichoresis. And Ramon said that's the same way he sees the Trinitarian nature of reality. 
I <clears throat> asterisk the word Andros here, uh, a focus of ongoing debate in his seminar. Uh, we argued about this a lot. <laughs> uh, this was also the maybe the one, one of the peaks of the feminist consciousness rising. So we were especially concerned that Andros, which means specifically male human, is not the right word for trying to express a complete Trinitarian reality. We argued that it should be theanthropocosmic instead of cosmotheantric. Although we admitted that the anthropocosmic is a much more unwieldy word than cosmotheantric, which is relatively um, easier to say. That's the end of my geekiness interlude. So back to the the ego self that thinks it's outside or just a spectator and a controller of the universe. Here's the way that an enlightened cat named Mooch expresses it. To find your inner purr, you must let go of your ego and lose yourself. And his friend asks, how do you do that, Mooch? And he says, who's Mooch? Let go of your ego. Buddhist tradition calls it emptiness, which is also the same as enlightenment. A central voice in the Christian tradition says it this way. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The experience of God, referring here to the book, The Experience of God, according to this review, the experience of God is a meditation in which we come to realize that in living the experience of God, it is not our experience, but God's experience living in us. We become like St. Paul, Christ living in us, or the whole Christ. God's experience living in us, that, that's an absolutely core sutra for entering into Panikkar. Time for a parable. <clears throat> Let's wonder for a moment about the origins of the, the world of separateness, the world of otherness that we usually feel trapped in. Where did that separation come from? I put it in terms of what I call the original, original sin. When God created the universe, God presented the animals to Adam. Adam never asked the animals, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? He named them. He gave them labels. He did not enter among them as family, but began to build his zoo. And when she appeared, did Adam cry out to her in wonder? Who are you? Speak me your name. He did not. He gave her a label. He named her. And when God asked, who created this separateness? Who made this world so lonely? Adam said in answer, she did. I call this a sin of labeling instead of listening. You could also call it the sin of othering. I'll conclude with just a few more sutras without unpacking them or even elaborating on them. There's one from Panikkar. We have said that the experience of God ought to be understood as a Trinitarian and hence relational and participative, participative being in which we and all creation enter. Being is capitalized there because we're not talking about God as a being as a separate entity, but rather being, the infinity of being, the divinity of being in which we and all creation enter. 
This is one of his most concise and most pregnant sutras. My I is the thou of God. Your I is the thou of God. For each of us, my I is the thou of God. I am God's thou. So the experience of God is the experience of non-dual consciousness and non-dual consciousness is what I like to call the sacrament of unothering. I ask you to join me in a, a prayer to God, the Creator. And so I pray, O oh God, Creator of the universe, sustainer of all, I offer my prayers of thanksgiving. For my birth in a world that fills me with wonder, for the beauties of earth, for each breath that I breathe, thanks be to you, O oh my God. For the plants whose gifts feed my body, for the flowers that awaken my heart, thanks be to you, O oh my God. For the spiraling arms of our galaxy home, For the arms that embrace me in friendship or love, thanks be to you, O oh my God. For the most distant star in infinity's space, for the innermost flow of my thoughts, thanks be to you, O oh my God. For the ongoing power of creation itself, and the honor of living my part in its awakening, thanks be to you, O oh my God. For my ability here now to pray, thanks be to you, O oh my God. For each moment of silence as I rest in your grace, thanks be to you, O oh my God.